Olá a todos, uh, bem-vindos ao Berlin ao vivo, Linguists Online. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Berlin on Live, Linguists Online. I'm Patricia Santos, postdoc in population genetics at the University of Bordeaux. A Berlin ao vivo, Linguists Online is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association and is designed to give students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussions on the most diverse topics related to the study of human language. Is it with great pleasure that I'm mediating the lecture conducted by Dr. Igor Yanovic, a colleague whom I have known for a few years now, he is a computational historical linguist working in the University of Tübingen. He is interested in evolutionary approach to language change, linguistic phylogenetics, semantics and pragmatics, and in the interdisciplinary collaborations for uncovering the multifaceted past of human communities. Igor holds a PhD in theoretical linguists from the MIT. He has worked both in classical and computational historical linguistics and is currently engaged in several interdisciplinary projects aiming to uncover the human past and involving statisticians, geneticists, anthropologists and linguists. Igor is currently the leader of a DFG funded junior research group at the University of Tübingen. He held postdoctoral fellowships at the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the Philosophy Department at Carnegie Mellon University, and the DFG Center for Advanced Studies, Words, Bone Genes and Tools. The title of his presentation is Computational Inference in Non-Tree Models of Language Diversification, the case of Bantu. Thank you very much for presenting your work here at Aberlin, and I would like to remind the audience that questions can be asked in the chat. Hello, everyone. Obrigado a todos pela vossa presença. É uma honra para mim estar aqui. It is a great honor to be here at the Avralin Ao Vivo series. Uh, if this is your first time at the series, I really would encourage you to check out the full program of the talks organized by the Brazilian Linguistic Association in the past and also in the future, where you can listen to live translations like this one ask your questions in the chat and engage with the speakers in this way. Thank you for coming today. It is a great pleasure to be here. Let me start. Uh, I will talk today about computational inference, non-tree models of language change uh, and forming language families. And I will use the case study of the butter language family. This is not just my work. This is a work of four people. And each one of those four people actually contributed very considerably to the project so that it's our joint baby, so to speak. Silvia Girotto is a population geneticist uh, working at the University of Ferrara. She is involved in interdisciplinary collaborations with linguists and archaeologists and very interested in past population dynamics and inferring them from genetic data. Patricia Santos uh, is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bordeaux and also educated as a population geneticist. She's very interested in uh, interactions between genetics and culture and the inference of demographic histories. Andrea Benazzo, also from the University of Ferrara, is a bioinformatician and evolutionary geneticist. He's interested not just in uh, past population dynamics and uh, interactions with language, like in this project, but also in conservation genetics for uh, species which need conservation efforts. So, uh, even though I will be the one talking today, Patricia uh, is here kindly as a moderator for the talk. And uh, I would just like to repeat that this is really a joint project. So, I'm representing our common position and I'm going to uh, introduce you to this uh, case study, to the novel methodology which we developed, and show you towards the end of the talk uh, some examples which we find very exciting about the Bantu family. Uh, just a procedural matter. So uh, the talk will be a rather long one today. So probably something on the order of uh, 80 minutes, so a bit longer than the average talk at Avralin. 
Uh, so uh, we thought that it would be nice if we could uh, take your clarification questions at several uh, moments during the talk. So after uh, each of the sections of the talk, I will stop and I will ask Patricia to uh, provide me with clarification questions which you asked through the chat. So if you didn't understand something, I would like something to be repeated or uh, have a question of this nature, uh, please feel free to uh, ask it. Uh, it's our job to make it interesting for you. So we will try to do our best to answer them. And then at the end, we will have a general discussion section, which is not just for clarification questions, but also for more general questions about this research or about actually anything you would like to ask us, uh, including uh, the nature of interdisciplinary collaborations like this. So three geneticists and one linguist are working on evolutionary modeling of a language family. So welcome again, and let's start. Language families, trees, and non-trees. What am I talking about here? So this is a very, very simple uh, language tree that you're seeing. Uh, you probably saw such trees uh, if you studied linguistics at all. Uh, and here is uh, what we can uh, point out in this very, very partial uh, tree of the Indo-European language family, which is quite a large language family, but I'm only showing to you a very small segment of it. So uh, the Languages in blue here, Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Germanic, they are proto-languages. So we stipulate them as scholars, but we do not actually uh, have any records of them. So they are dead languages, which we reconstruct through science. Uh, Latin and Old Norse are also dead languages in Olive, but they are old languages for which we actually have texts. So we actually have a record of uh, those languages, even though, of course, it cannot be full, we cannot uh, hear the actual spoken speech of those languages, but at least we know uh, more about them than we can about, let's say, Proto-Germanic. And then at the bottom of the tree, English, German, Norwegian, French are just some examples of the Indo-European languages. In their living languages, they live today and they keep changing, including today and tomorrow and yesterday. Uh, from this short description, you can see that uh, there is a temporal dimension to this tree. So uh, Latin was spoken earlier than Old Norse, and so on and so forth, and this is generally how uh, such trees are interpreted, that there is a temporal axis. In this case, I draw the tree so that the temporal axis is vertical, but it could be also horizontal if I rearrange this tree like this. Uh, and uh, this you will find quite generally on the trees. Uh, so a family tree is both a means of visualization, so just a method uh, to conceptualize a particular language family in your mind, but also a model. So we will briefly discuss both of those aspects of a language family tree now. First, let's start with the visualization. So this visualization is actually uh, just a tool for us, a graphic tool, which allows us to read off certain information about the relationships of the languages in this family. So for example, uh, Latin is uh, higher on the tree on the same branch as French. This means that Latin is the ancestor of French. English is closer to German than English is to Norwegian because the path from English to German is shorter on the tree than the path from English to Norwegian. And English and Norwegian are closer to each other than either of them is to French or to Latin. So we can read uh, such information and therefore the tree is simply a representational device, we can think. But it is also a model of language family evolution. It is a model of language diversification. So how does a tree work as a model? Well, in a pure tree model of language families, the changes which languages experience uh, proceed the following way. So, uh, let's look at English and Norwegian. If we go back in time from English and Norwegian to Proto-Indo-European, we will see that it's only this branch on the tree that the two share. What this represents in this model is that what happened from Proto-Indo-European to Proto-Germanic, all language changes which happened there, should be shared by these two languages. But after the Proto-Germanic stage, uh, those two branches diverged, 
And therefore, all new changes which happened after this moment, after the split of Proto-Germanic, as linguists used to say, uh, they would be private to English or to Norwegian. So they would be independent from each other. From this, uh, we can derive that uh, over time, on average, languages after divergence will lose more and more of their similarity. And from this fact, from this fact of the model of the language family tree, we can actually see how we derive the representational value of the trees. So the languages which are farther from each other in the tree are farther from each other as languages. They share less linguistic features. Now, uh, this is all very good. Uh, the problem is that the real life is actually more complicated. In real language change, there are lots of uh, what we can call non-tree phenomena. So phenomena which do not uh, follow this uh, pure language family tree model. And here, I'm just giving you some simple examples from the life of English, just as one language about, uh, uh, of the many existing in the world. So in Middle English, for example, uh, English inherited uh, the pronoun they, which you know in today's English, from Old Norse. So before this, uh, English used he uh, pronoun to refer to they, but then it just changed uh, it with this borrowing. Uh, another borrowing in the lexical domain, in Middle English, alongside the inherited word fairness for beauty, which still exists with some uh, stylistic connotations in modern English, uh, English borrowed beauty from Old French, along with many, many other words which English borrowed from French at this period. And then today, present-day English is a very popular language in the world, so it serves as a source of borrowing for many, many languages. For example, in this phrase from present-day German, which I just heard on radio uh, several days ago, we have two such uh, very recent, very active borrowings. So uh, one of them is relatively simple, so it's a word paper, but it's clear that uh, it what, what the author uh, of this speech, uh, a professor of uh, virology, uh, actually means is a scientific article, so paper in only one of its meanings in modern English. And then the other example, Gereviudes, is actually even more interesting. So here, present-day German, uh, morphologically adapts this English past participle. So first, it adds this ge prefix, which is the normal prefix of uh, regular participles in German. But also, it adds the regular uh, German inflection for, in this case, it's accusative, neuter, singular, uh, to this article. So in, it kind of uh, nativizes uh, this English borrowing. So processes like this happen all the time, and we do not know whether these reviewed and paper will actually become a part of the German language spoken by everyone, or they would be just uh, attempts at borrowing, which will eventually fail. We don't really know, but in principle, there is nothing special about this. So languages which are related, like all of those languages mentioned here are, starting from English to Old Norse to Old French to present day German, they are related, they are part of the same Indo-European family. But uh, it doesn't mean that they, that they stopped exchanging material, like lexical material here, after they diverged. So how can we make sense of it? So the tree model was very nice, and visually it's quite attractive. It's also conceptually quite attractive. So uh, there are different versions of how we can conceptualize and represent non-tree histories for languages. One rather popular model is a so-called uh, wave of wave mo waves model. Uh, it's illustrated here, so you should understand this uh, picture as a kind of geographical map where different uh, letters correspond to different languages or, if you want, dialects. And the uh, solid lines here, what they represent is what linguists call an isogloss. So the idea is that the area within the solid line, or actually any other type of line here, is the area where a certain innovation spread, a certain new uh, feature, new word or new grammatical construction, or a change in uh, the function of a grammatical construction, which happened uh, in uh, these languages. So uh, what's interesting here is that this type of picture, this type of empirical picture, which actually happens in real life languages quite often, including in the Bantu family, which we will speak uh, much more about later, 
uh, it cannot be represented uh, via a tree. So why? Well, because we can easily divide all these languages into two parts. So there is A, B, and there is everyone else. So these are clearly can be treated as separate uh, clades in our tree. But then how do we determine the closeness relations for this uh, second group? So for example, is E closer related to D or closer related to F? And we need to make this decision if we are to draw a tree because uh, any tree actually implies such a decision. And it's very hard to make this decision because it's hard to decide whether it's the innovations which E shares with F but not with D or those which E shares with D but not with F that are more important for that. So there is something of a judgment call here. Uh, so the idea uh, of Francois specifically, uh, but also of other people who like the wave model, is that languages exist in space and innovations arise in one place but can spread through language contact. So the big question here is, can a new innovation X spread over the border of an older innovation Y? If the answer is no, so for example, I start my innovation here at B and it can only spread to A, but it cannot spread to C or E or F, um, then uh, this innovations area becomes nested within this old innovation area. And then if uh, those innovations are nested, they do not disturb the tree structure. We can still represent the history as a tree. On the other hand, if a new innovation can cross those borders, so the second type of answer, and the X and Y areas may intersect without nesting, then we cannot fully uh, map those innovations to particular nodes in the tree as we should in the pure tree model. Now, this is not the only way to represent and understand non-tree phenomena. Another way uh, is uh, taken here from uh, a Russian historical linguist, Anna Dibo, uh, and uh, it works like this. The idea is uh, that proximity for language contact may change with time. So it might make sense to use several trees kind of stacked in time to represent the closeness relations at different periods within the linguistic family. So, for example, here in the period one, it's the languages B and C which are likelier to share innovations than they are with A. So we can represent this with this tree where B and C form a clade, where they are closer together than A. On the other hand, in the next historical period, period two, something might have changed. So maybe the political structures have changed, maybe the economical structures, the trade structures have changed, maybe something else changed. And now uh, it's languages A and B which experience more language contact than they experience with C. And then we can represent the situation with uh, this different tree. So we have a sequence of trees through time. And this is also a sensible way to think about non-tree phenomena. Finally, there is a third way, well, actually not finally, because you can come up with more, uh, but this one is uh, what we will be using further in uh, this talk and this study. We call it history graphs, and they are basically very similar to what geneticists call admixture graphs. So the way uh, this model uh, of conceptualization is structured is as follows. So we still have a tree, which we call the backbone tree. It's given here in those black branches. But in addition to this backbone tree, which represents the true history of splits between different speech communities, so the true history of divergence events, uh, we also have added horizontal edges, the edges of borrowing. Uh, and uh, those edges, they have uh, the start time, they have the duration, they have the intensity, which might be different for different linguistic subsystems. So it could be that one language influenced another on the level of lexicon, but not on the level of grammar, for example, or vice versa. And uh, these three branches actually correspond to uh, those examples from the history of English, which I gave you. So English, uh, Middle English around here, uh, borrowed from Old Norse, the pronoun they. It borrowed from Old French around here, uh, word beauty. And it lent to German, the word uh, reviewed as gereviedes. So we can represent those uh, horizontal movement of linguistic features with those uh, directed uh, horizontal edges. 
Now, this is time uh, for our first clarification uh, question section. So, so I guess now for which I'm seeing in the chat, there is no questions. So I think you were clear. So there is one person asking if you can if they can do questions in the end of the presentation? Oh, yes, absolutely. You can do questions at the end of the presentation or at any time. Yes, we'll have a discussion section. And another person that is asking if it is possible to answer questions through YouTube comments or better to connect to Zoom. And I will tell again that is uh, the question should be made in the chat and then I will make, make the questions to Igor. So if you have some questions now, you can write them and I can ask him. Okay, so then let's just uh, uh, sum this up. What I want to stress here is that even though I showed you several ways to conceptualize non treaty developments, it's not like one of them is necessarily better than the other. It's really different alternative ways of thinking, uh, of grasping the same empirical reality. And for different applications, it could be that different ways of thinking are actually more suitable. So think about those models and also about the treasure presentations, not necessarily as something to uh, dispute in terms of which one is the best one, but rather as different tools which we can employ in order to understand the linguistic reality. Because the linguistic reality of uh, language change is very, very complex, and we can use all the tools which are useful for us in our thinking. So. Speaking of the complexity of language change, uh, in the next part of the talk, I will uh, tell you a little bit about probabilistic models of language change, and in particular about one uh, relatively common misconception about statistics and language change. So stay tuned. Uh, language change is a random process. So if you attended a historical linguistics class, you probably will, would have heard that. In which sense is it random? Well, we cannot predict its exact course. But this doesn't mean that there are no rules in language change. It's just that those rules are more probabilistic rules than deterministic rules. And there is order to this randomness. So for example, in grammatical change, we know that there are particular pathways of grammatical change which are quite common. So for instance, in Turkish, we have a verb okuyorum, uh, which used to mean I'm reading. In the, uh, in the progressive uh, aspect. But nowadays, it also can mean I read. So it has a more generalized meaning. Uh, now, actually, this type of change is quite common in languages, and we can uh, readily expect English in some centuries to also undergo the same change. So that I'm reading would be just your regular way of uh, saying I read as well as I'm reading. But we do not know when. We cannot predict this moment. Uh, this is the random component of that. And as for example of regularity and randomness together is the hierarchy of lexical borrowing. So certain words are clearly, empirical data show to us that they are clearly easier to borrow than others. So for instance, uh, many, many languages of the world have uh, borrowed the word for coffee. Uh, the word for hand is considered to be among nouns, one of the most stable on average. So you very rarely innovate a word for hand or borrow it from your neighboring language. And then words like am, so the first person singular of present tense uh, of be in English is a particularly stable uh, word which uh, can survive thousands of years, which actually it did in this case. Uh, so how can we model uh, such random processes? And why would we want to do this? Well, uh, we want to do this because modeling for, uh, processes mathematically can teach us something and also can make it possible for us to do statistical inference, which we will do in the Pantoki study in this talk. So here, I would like to introduce you to a very, very simple mathematical model, perhaps the simplest mathematical model of a random uh, process of language change. So we simply assume that for each moment of time, there is a very small rate that determines how likely our language change. So uh, for example, a borrowing of the word for hand or the borrowing for the word for coffee happens. 
So this probability is tiny at any little moment, but over uh, centuries and thousands of years, uh, it can uh, uh, actually happen that uh, such an event occurs. And here, uh, one important simplification is that I'm considering this event as if it were momentaneous. This is actually not true. So we know that language change actually proceeds gradually. So it takes some time for a language change to go to completion. We can actually abstract away from this at this level of abstraction. And then, if we conceptualized the, uh, our process of change as this, uh, what is called Poisson random process, which is characterized by the sick of eight lambda, we can compare different processes uh, by comparing their lambdas. So they can be faster or slower processes. For example, the process for coffee will be faster than the process for hand. And in the simple case, lambda will be constant. So for example, the probability that you borrow the word for hand will remain constant as you go through time. And then you can also define Poisson processes which are not constant, which, which actually have change in probabilities with time. So at this point, uh, let me show you a little illustration in R, which is a free and very powerful statistical software, but I'm not using it now for statistics, I'm just using it to do a little illustration, because I think that this, at least for me, this really helps me understand what kind of process I'm working with. So I wrote this little, little piece of code, and now I will run it. What this code does, it will simulate 10 times one and the same, mathematically one and the same random Poisson process. It's random, so I don't really know what will be simulated now. So what will happen now is as I press enter each time, uh, the simulation will add, uh, will walk upwards in time and add a new event. So let me do this. Okay, so our first event in the first process occurred about 250 years from the start. Now I press in, enter another time, Okay, the second event happened quite soon after that. Then there was a longer interval. Uh, now I, uh, I did enter and nothing happened. This means that the next event was outside of this visible window. So we uh, stopped this simulation now. So we have three events here. And the lambda rate of those events, which I used, which I defined the same for all the 10 processes was one event on average in 400 years. So this free in 100 years, this is uh, quite about average. So let's see what happens when we simulate more. So we started the second process and actually no events happened. The third, okay, one, two uh, events ended. The fourth one, just one event and it took a lot of time. Again, nothing happens more. Now we have ran uh, those 10 processes. Remember that the processes themselves are absolutely identical, yet the results are quite different. So they range from four events to zero events. And if you asked me uh, to just naively look at this picture and tell you, okay, do I think that uh, the data which I see on this picture show me that uh, those processes were identical or they were different? I would look at this and I would tell you, mm, it looks like they're different, right? Like some of them have zero events, some of them have one event, but then there are two which have three events here and here, one that has even four. So of course they're different, but this is of course not true. And I know this because I simulated them myself. I know that they were exactly identical to each other. So why uh, am I showing you this uh, example? I think that this uh, helps to see a little bit how complex it can be to make naive judgments about what uh, processes of language change actually are by looking at their outcomes. We really should go formal here and build an actual formal model and feed it with as much data as we can. And only then can we actually hope to get a better understanding of what's going on. So with this in place, uh, let me finally turn to the misconception which I promised you to talk about. And there is a very common misconception about modeling linguistic processes with mathematical random processes. It goes roughly like this, and it's actually quite a convincing misconception uh, it, because to some extent it's actually true. 
Uh, so the objection goes like this. In reality, we know by studying language that there are many specific factors influencing language change. For example, social factors, uh, the influence of uh, famous and popular writers or popular individuals in the society, maybe the influence of television in recent times and so on and so forth. So there are lots of those specific factors. If we model uh, language change with an abstract random process, which is just characterized by some change rate, aren't we properly discounting what we know about language change? Now, I think that the best way to address this uh, misconception is actually via an analogy. And it's the following analogy. Imagine throwing a dice, so a six-sided dice. Uh, you throw it several times. Each show's outcome is determined by the specific forces you applied in your hand, right? The topology of the table onto which you threw, the air properties, whether there is wind, maybe there are some other uh, physical uh, features which uh, affect this outcome. And on some level of specificity, the outcome of which dice throw will actually be uh, quite deterministic, perhaps. Yet, it still does make sense to model a dice throw by saying that each side is equally probable, right? So with this idea, we can also view modeling language change with random processes. So when we use a random process to model language change, we do not give up on understanding specific forces which affect language change. We should study those forces. This is just at a different level of abstraction. Uh, so the crucial difference from DICE here is that for language, we actually do not know in advance which random process is a good model. So we need to study this, we need to find out which. But in principle, there is nothing wrong and nothing simplistic in using a simple process to explain the global patterns of language change. It doesn't prevent us from studying the local patterns, the local factors behind it. Those studies would be complementary they would not uh, replace each other. And at this point is the second time when it's like to ask clarification questions, if you'd like. So there is still no questions. I don't know if you want to do like, an, again, another short summary or if you would like to proceed. Maybe in the end, people will do more questions. Are there clarification questions there? So something which would be useful to answer now? No, in the moment there is no clarification questions, I think. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So again, uh, if you want, you can keep going. Thank you, oh, thanks sorry, a lot for the question. So uh, when we speak of language change, we normally think first of phonology. Do you use some kind of weights for directions of change? Say K changing into G is more likely than K into D, for example? Uh, this is a very good question and a very long question. So let me try to give you a very short and therefore not very satisfactory perhaps answer. So first of all, uh, even though we do think about phonology, this is not the only kind of change which can happen. For phonology, of course, it does make sense to uh, say that certain patterns of change are more frequent than others. In fact, there is both uh, traditional historical linguistic work into such patterns and uh, also computational work. So for instance, there are ways to use databases of many, many languages uh, to try to infer which pairs of sounds correspond to each other more frequently in a different, for example, related languages. And this would give you uh, a global view on which sounds are more likely to be associated with each other in language changes from one to the other. So yes, surely. Uh, there are such phenomena, so not all changes are equally probable, and we can study which ones are more probable and which ones are not, both in the traditional qualitative framework of historical linguistics and also in modern statistical frameworks as well. And again, the two sides will complement each other. So the traditional historical linguistic side will be very useful because it shows to us how a particular process uh, went on in its own little details and why exactly as particular changes might have happened, uh, what was the environment, what kind of phonetic uh, cues might have been there, 
in order to facilitate this change. Whereas on the computational level, we can try to discover patterns valid for uh, many, many, many languages. And we can combine those two views uh, to build a better understanding of how human languages change in their phonology. Okay, thank you. Okay. Let's now turn to Banto. That's the first time uh, that we start talking about this language family, and let me introduce it a little bit. So the Banto family is one of the largest families in the world. It's large by the number of languages, so on different estimates, it's somewhere between 400 and 600. It's also one of the largest in terms of the number of speakers. It's estimated that around 300, 000, oh, sorry, 300 million uh, speakers speak those languages. Uh, it is, Lomond languages are spoken in large parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's a part of an even larger family, usually called Niger Congo, but there are also several alternative families. So other Niger Congo languages are spoken in kind of this part of Africa, so not shown in the map partly. Uh, the assumed homeland of the Bantu languages, or the assumed historical homeland, is in North Cameroon. Why? Oh, basically for two reasons people think, scholars think that this is the case. One is that we have a particularly uh, dense diversity of Bato languages in this area. And second, and perhaps more importantly, this would be a good area of interface with the other families of the larger uh, Niger Congo family. So since they're spoken around this area and further to the West, if the Bantu languages started around here, it makes perfect sense how they could be a part of this larger Niger Congo language area. The usual time depth of the family, so the start of its expansion, is usually given as something like four to five thousand years or 3.5 to 5,000 years in the literature. The arguments for this uh, particular time range are actually not that convincing, but uh, we don't really have a good way to answer this question of when exactly this uh, dispersion started. Uh, why? Well, because the later history, uh, it's actually quite uh, well, relatively well understood for the Bantu. So we know that there have been two uh, large movements of Bantu languages and presumably also Bantu people, given the genetic data, uh, to the south from uh, on the western side of the continent and on the eastern side of the continent from this African Great Lakes area to the south. But the earlier history of the family is unknown. Now you can see if you're interested in a recent overview here in uh, Cohen Boston's work. Uh, I will show at the end of the talk the bibliography so that you can check out the actual references. Um, so just uh, scroll to the end of the talk if you're viewing this as a recording. Uh, so what about this early history? Well, there are basically two competing big hypotheses about what could have happened and we can adopt them early split and late split. So, uh, the, on the map here, they are represented on the left and the right, and these black dots here is the current rough extent of the equatorial of African rainforest, which is quite a special area. It's not very easy to live in the rainforest, so you need to be specially adapted in order to survive there well. Mm. So getting through the uh, rainforest is not supposed to be very easy if you're a young and expanded language family. So the early split hypothesis says that, well, perhaps what happened is that from this homeland in Cameroon, uh, there were two independent movements. So uh, first, some groups uh, or uh, some languages spread through the forest to the south, to this uh, number two, and then further south and uh, oh, east from there. Whereas some other groups spread to the Great Lakes area, uh, formed in another nucleus uh, with three here, and then continued to spread south. Uh, the second hypothesis is a late split hypothesis, which says, well, first the languages kind of move through the forest first, and then divide into the west and east. Now, uh, it's interesting that actually uh, Follow environmental reconstructions show that about two to 2.5 thousand years ago, there was a period where the extent of the rainforest was much smaller than today. 
So here on this map, which just shows you Africa around the equator, and these are the Glade Lakes in blue. In light green, here is the current extent of the equatorial rainforest. And in those cross-hatched areas, that's the refugia of the forest during this interval of the forest retraction. So you could see that there was actually a way to get to the south, to the southern areas, to the basin of the big Congo River, through uh, this corridor which opened in the forest, which was not, uh, of course, uh, there were trees there, there were patches of forest, but no uh, contiguous forest here. So it should have been easier to move back then. Now, uh, in principle, the first idea which anyone should have who knows a little bit of historical linguistics to solve this question of early split versus late split should be, what is the language family tree? Because if we know the language family tree, this will solve our question. So here, in different colors, in different five colors, I show the uh, uh, approximate locations of the different Bantu languages which we have in this study. Uh, and those colors represent five geographical zones. So, uh, and I also use uh, semi-matching colors here in these uh, trees. So I show you these trees in two formats, in kind of a quasi-geographical format and in a more usual vertical format. So uh, on the early split, we are supposed to have the following tree topology. So we have the homeland zone northwest, NW, here. Uh, we have one uh, zone, one uh, clade of the tree, the eastern one, ranging out of this zone of the homeland independently from these western zones. So if we redraw this tree as a normal vertical format, then we will see that uh, these languages will form a clade. They will not form a clade with the eastern languages, and we don't really know, so there can be different uh, versions to uh, spell this out, what happened here and what happened here, uh, which of those uh, pairs would be closer to each other. But the crucial point is that on the early split theory, we're supposed to have the eastern zone not to be a part of the western zone clade. Now, under the late split, what happened, remember, was that there was one move out of the uh, homeland to the south through the rainforest. So it's this arrow here. And then from there, somehow or other, the other four zones were formed. So again, we don't know what exactly happened here, uh, in which order those diversified. But under this theory, uh, what we want to say is that the eastern uh, zone is a part of a common clade with the western zones to the exclusion of the homeland close zone northwest. So it seems like the question is very easy. Now we only need to find the language family tree. But the problem is that there is no agreed upon Bantu family tree. And it's not because people did not try. You know, I really uh, encourage you, if you're interested in the historical linguistic aspect of that, to check out this very good handbook article, uh, which is still, I believe, the most authoritative attempt at the global reconstruction of the Bantu family tree using traditional historical linguistic means. And basically, they conclude that, you know, we can make out the uh, local groups, we can make out some intermediate groupings, but we cannot determine what the structure, the global structure of those big parts of the family is like. We just cannot. There is conflicting information. So why would that be? Why would that be? Recall now what was said about the unknown tree like developments. So of the developments when different innovations crisscross each other's areas. Uh, when it's a situation like this, we cannot really map those innovations to form a single tree which describes the history well. How can this arise? How can such a situation arise? Well, basically, there are kind of two general scenarios under which it might happen. So first of all, there might be general non-tree likeness, so to speak, in the language family development. So innovations can spread through language contact, which just does not respect the earlier split lines. And this would be something which we uh, then will see here. So even though those innovations crisscross each other, uh, what we also see that each of them is uh, associated with a contiguous geographical area. 
So uh, they're not discontinuous. They do not pop up in different parts of the geographical domain where this language family is spoken. And then there can be also multiple parallel development because certain language changes uh, are actually more likely than others. And in fact, some of them might be likely enough for several languages, for instance, in the Bantu family to develop them quite independently. And then what we would expect to see is that we would see on the map different areas where the same innovation has happened, but they would not necessarily be contiguous with each other. And the truth is that the Bantu language family is notorious for the non-tree-like phenomena which happen in it. I will just show you three, but they are really just examples. You start looking, there are lots of them. Uh, so the first one concerns a very basic phonological property of the Bantu languages. So the two most common uh, vowel systems of the Bantu languages are the seven vowel and the five vowel systems. Uh, phonetically, they can actually be uh, represented uh, quite differently. So those, uh, especially the middle vowels can be realized as very different phonetic sounds. But structurally, we have seven vowel languages, five vowel languages. Also, I think we have some uh, nine vowel languages in the north, uh, but they're not as common. And using historical linguistic arguments, well, we can see that it's the seven vowel system which seems to be the proto-Bantu system. So the system which uh, existed at the level of the proto-Bantu language. And that the five vowel system is consequently an innovation where some of those small uh, vowels uh, just uh, merged with each other. Uh, and now let's look at the map uh, from Larry Hyman's work. Uh, the seven vowel area is uh, given in the solid on the map. And this five vowel area is given in this cross hedged. Now, uh, the problem is that both the five vowel and the seven vowel systems form contiguous large blocks. Uh, now, the seven vowel system areas are kind of uh, distributed all over. And this is in principle normal. We expect this from uh, an archaic system which could be retained from the previous state of the language, whereas some other languages have changed in an innovation. But what is very suspicious here is the fact that this five vowel area, it's a contiguous block which does not actually correspond to any other way to uh, form the single tree out of the Bantu languages. So to give you just a very simple example, here in the south, uh, it's a so-called S-zone languages of the Bantu, and they are known to form a relatively close uh, clade of the Bantu tree. So uh, if we can be sure about something in the, uh, in the Bantu family, it's uh, the status of some local groupings. They do seem to, uh, to, to actually be very closely related to each other. And yet some of those languages retain a seven vowel system and some of them have the five vowel system. How is this possible when this five vowel system is shared with some very distant languages which are quite different on many, many other features? It's really a puzzle. And this puzzle can only be explained if this five vowel system was actually spread, if this merger was somehow spread uh, with the help of language contact between uh, adjacent areas, which crisscrossed the earlier distinctions between the languages. Another example of something which is non-tree-like is the distribution of a locative suffix ening. This suffix is uh, represented in three groups of Bantu languages here on the map. Now, uh, Thiele Schaderberg argues that uh, this morphological innovation of a new locative suffix uh, is such that it's highly unlikely that it developed in parallel, that those three areas developed it independently. Why? Because it's not based on a productive morphological process or syntactic process for that matter. And the marker itself has no transparent etymological origin, which we would expect. So if we saw what this was formed from, then maybe we could uh, conclude that, oh, this, this type of word or marker or morpheme uh, it's actually quite likely to develop into a locative suffix. So it's quite natural that those languages could develop this independently from each other, but we don't see this source. So this seems to be very unique development. Now, uh, Schadenberg also argues that uh, this innovation is actually quite serious in that it interferes a lot 
town class system was a system of uh, very multiple genders in, in the Bantu. So the Bantu languages have a lot of nominal classes, like up to 20 plus, and uh, it's a fundamental uh, part of their morphological system. Uh, so Schadenberg argues that since this locative suffix interferes with this class system, it would have been very unlikely to disappear, so to be uh, innovated, but then disappear from the language without leaving any other trace in the system which we can use to restore the previous state, to say that, oh, for example, now this language here, which does not have the suffix, uh, actually is very likely to have had it in the past because it shows such and such strange phenomena. So all those, uh, all those uh, facts, they point to uh, the conclusion, they, uh, imply the conclusion that this innovation should be considered as an innovation which happened uniquely in the history of the Bantu family. But the problem is those three groups of languages, they do not form a clade according to the other phenomena. They do not form a close subfamily to the exclusion of all of those languages spoken in the same area. So it's really mysterious what happened here. It must be some sort of language contact or language uh, territory reorganization or something, but we don't really know. All we can say is that this is not a tree-like phenomenon. And then uh, the third example, which I'd like to give you, uh, concerns loanword adaptation. And here, uh, what is important is that uh, the traditional classical historical linguistics, the comparative method, can often establish quite a lot of facts about the history of words which have been borrowed between languages based on the regular sound changes which happened. So for example, uh, we can often distinguish true cognates, so words which descend from the same word in the proto-language, which are inherited, and words which uh, just look similar because they were borrowed at a later point after diversification by one language from the other. So for instance, one line of descent involves this Proto-Germanic uh, noun Kakon. It was a star uh, because this is reconstructed form. We don't have records of Proto-Germanic. This is a scholarly reconstruction of what this word might have looked like. Uh, this turned into Old Norse Kaka, which meant cake. And this was then uh, borrowed into Middle English, which is on a different branch of the Germanic family. Uh, as kake, which then, due to regular sound changes, ch changed into modern English cake. So that's one line of development from kakon to cake through a borrowing between Old Nor from Old Norse to Middle English. Now there is a second line of development too. So the same kakon gave rise to Middle Dutch uh, koke, uh, and then when uh, we add the diminutive, it uh, results in the modern Dutch koke. Uh, which can mean uh, a little cake, so a diminutive of cake, or it can mean a cookie. And this leads to the English word cookie, which is borrowing from Dutch, either Middle Dutch or uh, Modern Dutch. I do not know this history precisely, so I cannot tell you which. Now, actually, Old English used to have a true cognate of all of those words, uh, which descended apparently from the Kakon in Proto-Germanic, but then it wasn't really used that much in uh, Old English. We mostly find it in glosses, and uh, it didn't leave much trace uh, in later language history. So this demonstrates that using arguments which I didn't tell you about, historical linguists could identify that, oh, there were those borrowings in the history of this word. It would be nice if we could use this technique to differentiate inherited proto words from borrowings within the family, because if there are lots of borrowings, maybe if we subtract those borrowings and only look at the inherited lexicon, then we would be able to tell what the original tree was, and then we would be able to decide this early versus late split question. The problem only is the Bantu languages are very industrious. And in particular, one of their uh, historical feature is that they're champions in land war, in loanword adaptation. Uh, so the same uh, historical linguist Stila Schadenberg uh, gives uh, this uh, example. So we know that Swahili has uh, borrowed the word ta for lump 
uh, from some other non Bantu languages, probably some uh, Indian language, but we don't really know which. Now, the Bantu language Ha from the zone D uh, uh, geographically uh, borrowed this from Swahili as Tara. Now, this Tara does not really look like Ta, doesn't it? So, uh, why, why would why would ha add this? Uh, this is not an inflection. This is not regular inflection of uh, nouns, for example. This is really uh, a mysterious uh, component. Like why why would they do this? Well, uh, we can actually see why they did this if we look at the true cognates inherited from Protobanto, apparently by those languages, as far as we can tell. So the word for charcoal is a uh, ka in Swahili, and it's kara in ha. So what the Ha speakers did here, apparently, is they identified the regular correspondence between A in Swahili and Ara in their own language. And then they applied this correspondence. They made the change to the star word to change it into Tara when they borrowed it from Swahili. So they kind of camouflaged a borrowing as if it was a joint inheritance. This is really astonishing. And this is another example of why it is so hard to figure out the language family tree structure of the Bantu family. Now, um, this really prevents us from getting a lot of mileage as Nurse and Phillips in 2003 have written uh, using the classical comparative method of historical linguistics. So how does this method work? Well, we try to find innovations, for example, sound changes, grammatical category structuring, other changes. And then we try to build a tree so that each innovation corresponds to a claim. So that's how we reconstruct the language family tree. Now, if this works, this is supposed to provide a precise answer. The only problem is data are rarely fully tree-like and certainly not in the bound. The method is just not working very well at least for now. Maybe in the future, there will be analysis which will succeed more on this, but for now, it's really hopeless. So now it is time to turn to the computational statistical perspective. And this is a perspective which has been developing over the last two decades or so, uh, which tries to apply methods from uh, computational biology to linguistic problems. Um, what this, uh, statistical method requires is to find many features which are roughly comparable to each other. So in the historical uh, comparative method, we're usually looking for actually unique innovations, innovations which are rare to occur in parallel development. If it's unique, it's perfect for us. In the computational statistical perspective, it's quite the opposite. We don't want uniqueness because from a single one, uh, we cannot statistically infer much. What we want is we want many linguistic features which are roughly similar to each other because for the statistics, for the computational statistics, the strength is in numbers. It's from this general pattern which we can infer uh, that we might be able to give the answer. But that's why the most usual type of data which historical computational linguists uh, are using is uh, word lists and competency judgments. Why? Because it's true that different words may, be, may have different rates of lexical replacement or lexical borrowing, uh, but at least they are roughly comparable uh, features of language. And we can try, for example, to use a word list with particularly stable words, uh, hoping that uh, this will give us a signal of the earlier history of the family. The nice consequences of using the statistical approach is that we, for free, get the statistical machinery for testing reliability of our studies, for quantifying uncertainty. Uh, the linguists are not the first ones to use those methods, and there are good methods for uh, checking their validity developed. Now, the problem is that, of course, uh, I think that this is easy and those are common methods, but you also need to know how to actually apply them. And you need to be familiar with the many implicit assumptions which those methods make. It's not necessarily bad to make those assumptions, but you need to be to know what exactly you're doing. So, uh, turning to this statistical side, given that comparative method in statistics have different strengths, 
could it be that statistics can answer our questions about the early versus late split? Now, uh, lexical statistic work trying to uh, make inferences on the basis of shared cognates uh, in the Bantu languages has a long tradition. Nowadays, uh, what is more common is even more statistically involved computational phylogenetic work, which reconstructs trees from patterns of sharing. And there is uh, a computationally accessible uh, database, an open database published by Rebecca Grolemont and colleagues in 2015 associated with this paper, which has data for about 400 bundle languages. What these data are is for 100 meanings, they provide the words in this particular language, uh, as a word in this particular language, which expresses this meaning. And the database comes with cognitive judgments, with the expert judgment of which of those words actually uh, stem from a say, the same common uh, ancestral word. Now, those cognitive judgments are not ideal, they're not derived via a classical uh, full-scale comparative method. They're based on similarity and are somewhat impressionistic. The problem is that the sheer scale of analysis actually makes it very hard to derive a fully fledged uh, comparative uh, method analysis here. So we have what we have. And the data has the following shape. So it's just a part of the very big table. And we can see that in the uh, in the columns here, we have different means. So for example, animal, arm, ashes, bark. And here, the numbers correspond to the so-called cognate class or cognate set, uh, which expresses this meaning in uh, these languages. So what this means is that the languages which share the same number and the same color in this uh, uh, table have the word uh, for this meaning, which stems from the same ancestral word in some proto language at some level. And then if we have a different number like one and two here, this means that the words for the word for arm, for the mean arm, are different. They stem from different astral words in these two languages. So that's what the data look like. Now we can use this data and the very modern and really good statistical methodology of methodology of MCMC. And what we get is the following posterior, which I show here from uh, Rebecca Grolemont's paper, uh, slightly reorganized. So uh, this is a horizontal form of the tree, not the vertical form of the tree. So the root of the tree is here. And these different clades, they actually, the different triangles, they correspond to groups of languages, not to a single language. Uh, and I'm using the uh, usual Gothic classification Bantu labels uh, to refer to them. And I also added those markers like Northwest, Westwest, Southwest, Central, West, East on the side to remind you of which geographical zone of the five very uh, group uh, geographical zones uh, these languages, uh, this language cluster uh, belongs to. So uh, what we can see here on this map is that uh, indeed the eastern zone uh, seems to be a part of the much larger clade together with the western languages. So uh, at, at first blush, uh, what this looks like is a support, uh, supporting evidence for the late split theory. However, we should also look at those numbers here. So these are percentages, and they are called the posterior probabilities of the respective clades. And those posterior probabilities of the clades are actually rather low. So uh, they are on the order of uh, 70 to 90 percent, and this is not so so large. So what this means uh, that what does it mean that this clade has the probability of 88 percent? Well, it means that there is a 12% probability that uh, this clade does not exist, that the structure of the family is different. And this is a fairly large probability of error. So it does present evidence, uh, but this evidence is not uh, unambiguous. And what we did in this project, we also tried to apply a different method to quantify our uncertainty about this inference. So we applied a different uh, phylogenetic method called maximum likelihood, and we checked uh, the stability of those maximum likelihood trees by applying the statistical technique called bootstrap. Uh, what you need to uh, get out of this picture is a very, very simple fact. This uh, family tree really looks like a comb, 
mostly. Uh, it mixes the different uh, clades in different combinations. And what this means is basically that the method does not give you a straightforward answer as to which structure uh, the language family actually has. There is a lot of conflicting signal in the data. What Bootstrap does, it uh, basically checks how sensitive our conclusions are to small fluctuations in our data, which could be due to chance. So, for example, we sampled the word for arm, but maybe we didn't sample some other uh, quite common word, which is not very likely to change. And if we replace the word for arm in our questionnaire for those languages with another word with a different pattern, then we should ask how likely are such changes to actually change our results. And this result of this slide shows that, well, actually our results, our inferences depend on individual data points just too much. They're not very good estimates. They're not very certain. So uh, the conclusion again is that the overall tree is not very reliable. Now, uh, if we summarize the very brief recent history of research, so, uh, this paper, Nurse and Phillips in 2003, it used the classical comparative method. It established low level groupings, but it failed to produce a global tree of the Bantu languages. And the problem uh, which prevented them from doing so is basically spread of innovations through contact. Rebecca Grolemund uh, has published one of the best uh, existing analysis uh, using the computational statistics of the Bantu phylogeny. Uh, she does report a tree a tree which I showed you earlier, but this tree is actually not as certain as we would like it to be. So it looks like there is some conflicting signal. And then uh, I just want to mention this uh, recent study by Sarah Bakirotti and co-authors. Uh, it is not about the global structure of the Bantu family, it's about a one small clade. But what is very good about the study is uh, its methodological uh, accuracy. So these authors avoid overinterpretation and correctly highlight that the posterior probability of 70 or 80 percent is actually quite low. We cannot make strong uh, conclusions on the basis of trees with just such posterior probabilities. Uh, they also explicitly discuss some issues which are rarely discussed in linguistic literature on phylogenetics, namely the dependence of the results on sample composition and the interference from language contact effects. So basically, if you want to learn how to apply phylogenetic methodology properly, I can only recommend this uh, recent Bantu paper. Uh, so what next? The computational results do not seem to be very reliable. This is a bad thing, isn't it? Well, actually, it's not a bad thing. And it's very important here to know that uh, we can what we can formulate as a motto, good statistics should be able to fail. It should be able to give you a clue that something is wrong that you derived. Now, modern Bayesian phylogenetics is a reasonably good statistics, actually. Uh, in particular, there are mathematical results that show that if the true history of the language family is a tree, and we have enough data, and certain conditions, in particular, the rates of change are met, then the method is actually guaranteed to, on average, return the truth. This is the best guarantee which you can get in statistics, basically. But not all of those ifs. In the real world, those preconditions would often not be met. This is in itself not necessarily a problem. It does not mean that we should not apply those methods. In fact, applied statisticians uh, working on problems everywhere from astronomy to medicine apply approximate methods all the time. This in itself is not a problem as long as you know what you're doing. What you should ask is rather how serious is the problem. And then if the problem is serious enough, a good method can actually say, well, you know, I can do this. I just can. No, 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 no. What we as scholars need to do is we need to listen. Uh, if we're unlucky, we might not even notice that there is something problematic in the data. But actually, looking more closely at the tree from Rebecca Gromon's study in the Tower Bootstrap and Maximum Likelihood Analysis, we can see clear warning signs. There's clearly something bad going on here. But it's important to recognize that the fact that we can recognize this, it means we are lucky. It's not a bad situation that we failed. It's a good situation. Why then? In scholars still try to infer trees, including computational phylogenetics for the Bantu languages. 
we know that in the Bantu, there are lots of mysterious non-tree-like processes, both in the lexicon and in the grammar. Well, the answer to the question of why scholars try to infer trees is very simple, because tree inference is, relatively speaking, easy. If your true history is a tree, you're going to get the right tree out of it, out of your inference. If your history is not a tree, it's not only hard to draw a good visual representation of that history, as you might have noticed when we looked at this wave representation, subsequent trees representation, history graph representation, they're not that nice and they're different from each other. There is an even more serious problem. It becomes extremely difficult to do statistical inference in non-tree models. The model just becomes way too complex, too many variables. In technical speak, we say that computing the likelihood of our model becomes intractable. And when a statistician hears that, they're not happy. This is not a good situation. So what we did in this study of ours on the Bantu family is we built a framework for doing inference in just such a complex model. We pay for this with certain simplifications, but we think that uh, there are some interesting results to be derived. And on that, let me ask for clarification questions again. So we have a question. Uh, if we somehow get anthropological data for the degree of isolation of different tribes speaking different varieties, does it make sense to operationalize this degree of isolation and make it predictor for the probability of borrowing a word? Yes, it would certainly be an interesting attempt. Why not? And then again, I think that uh, whether this will be a useful predictor or not is something which you can't know in advance, but this is where you would like to use what the usual methods for testing reliability of your statistical inference will tell you. So it can tell you that this is actually a very reasonable predictor of linguistic similarities. Or it can tell you that uh, it cannot really guess uh, better than chance or something like that. So this will help you to make a decision as to whether there seems to be a genuine correlation between uh, anthropological similarity and linguistic borrowing. I can easily imagine scenarios where anthropologically similar societies would be more prone to uh, have language contact with each other at more intensity. But I can also imagine instances where, for example, there are neighboring societies with complementary uh, economic systems, which do a lot of exchange which is like with each other, and which might have different social organizations because, for example, they have different organization of economic production. Uh, let's say in a very simple case, you can have a pastoralist population and you can have agriculturalist population living side by side and exchange at some of the products which are easier to produce by one side than to the other. Uh, and you can imagine that there would be uh, quite a lot of language contact uh, involved when those uh, systems, uh, when, when, when people from those two systems interact with each other across this line. But it's a very uh, good thought. Thank you. Let's turn to our study then. How do we do it? Well, our model of language uh, family history is now not a tree, but a history graph. Uh, we divided the Bantu languages into five marker zones, roughly uh, based on the uh, groupings which were uh, made by Nurse and Philipson. Uh, and then we made the simplifying assumption that there is no structure uh, of relatedness of the families within each of the five marker zones. Now, this is a very, very uh, untrue assumption, as it were. We know that some of the languages in the Northwestern zone are much more closely related than some other languages within the same zone. Still, we're making this assumption. And we believe that this is a reasonable simplification at this level of abstraction, given that we got a good accordance between uh, our results and the uh, actual empirical data. So we are making this simplification. Uh, we are having the backbone tree 
uh, given by those arrows here. This is the backbone tree topology. And then we also have those dashed lines, which represent linguistic contact flowing between different zones. And we will try to uh, infer the intensity of this language contact. So this is a non-tree model. It's not just a tree, it's a tree with contact phenomena added. It's very simplified such history. Without the simplification, it would not be computationally tractable. But uh, still, the good question is, does it actually help? So can we get anything out of this? Um, now, uh, what we should note immediately is that uh, this actually becomes, even though we did all of those simplifications, this is still a very, very complex model, actually, mathematically. In particular, a technical fact about it is that uh, computing the exact likelihood of our data under a particular uh, set of parameters for the model is just not tractable. However, we are very lucky in that with this type of model, while you cannot really uh, compute the statistical quantity, which would be very useful if we could compute it, what we can do is we can simulate a pseudo history based on the parameters of the model. And this opens the road to the, using the technique called approximate Bayesian computation, or shortly ABC. It's a family of computational statistical methods which do not require the actual exact likelihood. They only require being able to simulate pseudo histories from your model. So how does this work? We can compare this by analogy with theoretical linguistic reasoning. How do we compare different theories or hypotheses in theoretical linguistics, but also actually in other social sciences, in history, in archaeology, in anthropology? Well, we operationalize each theory, each hypothesis. We derive their empirical predictions. And then, having done that, we check which of those agree with the data best. Right? Now, here's how we compare theories or models and ABC in approximate Bayesian computation. We operationalize mathematically each theory or model. We derive their empirical predictions through simulation. So not the universal set of their predictions, but just one example. However, because we do a lot of simulations, millions of them, in fact, we have a range of what is empirically possible under this model. And then we check which of those simulations agree best with the data, under which model. Uh, this slide just uh, gives you another reference to Mark Pomont's recent overview of ABC framework. It's uh, technical, it's written not for linguists, uh, but it outlines the current methods. Uh, it gives important references and uh, notes the open current issues. Here is a general schema of how the method works. Our models are parameterized. So we have parameters such as, for example, population size, such as the timing of different diversification events in the language family history, the intensity of language borrowing, and so on. We sample parameter sets from some prior distributions we defined. Then for each parameter set, which we selected at random in this way, we simulate a possible history in our model. And then we summarize this simulation in a set of so-called summary statistics. Uh, once we did that for a lot of simulations, we validate. We check for agreement between the simulated and the real summary statistics, SUSTs, and otherwise for other signs of model reasonableness. If things look good, then we use for our statistical inference those parameter sets that produced those summary statistics, those predictions that are actually close to our real data. Now, here is how it works in our case. Our real data is the data set by Rebecca Grolemont, which consists of the distributions of cognate sets for 100 minions across the five micro, micro zones, actually across the languages in the data set, but we uh, divided those languages into just five macro zones and pretended that there is no structure, that all of the languages within a macro zone are interchangeable with each other. Then we did a lot of simulations. So in each simulation, we selected one of the six backbone trees which we defined. So two for early split, two for late split, and then we also noted that, okay, maybe we have a different topology for very late split. 
Um, we sampled split times, borrowing rates, and so on and so forth, all of the parameters for each model, which we needed for the simulation. And then we ran a simulation of the history, a simulation for one mean. Over time in the simulation, the word for this meaning can change to a different word to experience mutation in the inheritance process using the genetic term uh, with a certain mutation rate theta. If there is a horizontal uh, dashed edge, uh, then in principle, the word can also be replaced by a borrowing coming from a different bantu microsome. So we do not model the borrowing within the zones, we just bor uh, model the borrowing uh, across the zones. And then in each simulation, we just repeat this process 100 of times uh, in order to get uh, a distribution for 100 pseudo means. Now, uh, why do we need to uh, use not just those full simulations, but just summary statistics? Well, there are basically uh, there is a practical answer to this. We just cannot work with the full simulated histories. So if we simulated the whole history, the whole pseudo history of how a particular word experienced uh, lexical change events, lexical replacement events, and lexical borrowing events, it would be just a large tree, perhaps a large tree. And it's not very clear how we would try to compare this to the real world data because we don't even have this historical tree for the real world. This is what we're trying to find out. However, if we only uh, compute some summary statistics of the present day distribution of our empirical data, so this is what we have in our database, and then we pretend for our simulations that we did not see this tree, we only saw the distribution at present which it generated, then we can compute the same statistics for this simulation, and then we can compare them. So our summary statistics were uh, the four moments, mean, variance, skewness, and kurtosis, of the number of uh, different words for the same meaning across uh, different zones and within one zone. And uh, why do we have four moments? Well, uh, those moments, they, they describe different uh, probability distributions. So this is illustrated on this uh, little pair of pictures. So this shows to you the normal distribution, which you might have heard about before. So this bell curve distribution. Now, this distribution has the uh, mean of the distribution, the expected value is the distribution of one, and it has a so-called standard deviation of one, two. So the standard deviation determines how far on average the values from this distribution fall from the mean. Now, this distribution is very different. This is the exponential distribution. Uh, however, it actually has the same mean and the same standard deviation, therefore variance, as this distribution. So they look very different, but they have the same parameters here, the same summary statistics, if you will. So that's why we're also looking at those uh, skewness and kurtosis moments, uh, because they would actually be different for this distribution. So this way, uh, from each empirical distribution of the number of cognates, of cognate sets, uh, we are deriving just four numbers, but those four numbers, they describe a lot about the distribution. The structure of our primary data are actually as follows. So we can read off the database facts like the following. For mean animal, for the first mean, in our northwestern zone, we have, let's say, I don't actually, I didn't look up the exact number for this, but let's say that there are 26 different cognate classes in the 98 languages which we have in the zone. Now, we also note that there are between these two zones, northwestern and westwestern, so there are two adjacent zones, uh, there are five different cognitive classes which occur both in northwest and in westwest. So that will be another data point. And then when we have those data points for animal, for arm, for ashes, and so on and so forth, we compute the mean of those values. So that's our first summary statistics, the mean value for this zone northwest. We compute standard deviation, or we compute kurtosis and skewness. And similarly, we compute the same uh, statistics for the number of classes shared between the zones. And we can see from those statistics, for example, that on average, so for the mean, uh, the northwest and westwest share more classes than northwest and east. 
So this is how our summary statistics looks like. So it's really just a, a string of numbers, I believe 60 of them. Now, the good news is that the ABC method can very easily fail. Remember the motto, good statistics should be able to fail. Namely, it can be that we did a lot of simulations with our model, but if our model has no uh, relation to the actual empirical reality, we will see that no simulation produced statistics anywhere close to the statistics of our real linguistic data. And in fact, it's interesting that in our study at an intermediate stage, we had exactly this result. And our first experiment was the real linguistic data. This actually happened. We were exploring at first a similar model of language change, where we assumed that lexical change happens for our 100 minutes at the same constant rate. We know that this is probably not true, but we thought, okay, we should first explore the model which is simpler, just to see what we get out of it. And maybe the simpler model would have worked. Maybe it would be a harmless simplification. But no, what turned out to happen was that uh, the simulation statistics did not match those of the real data. And they did not match them in a very, very clear pattern of uh, the real data was just over dispersed. This is the technical term. And from that, we knew that uh, what we should do is we should actually apply rate variation. So we should say that actually the different meanings in our empirical linguistic data set, they have slightly different associated nature rates of lexical replacement, of change in one word, which expresses its meaning with another. Uh, we intended to do this anyway for realism at the later stage. And then we tried to do this, and then we compared the summary statistics which we obtained with the real data, and now they actually matched pretty well. So, uh, now that uh, I told you that we have validated the model relatively well, can we use it to decide the early versus late split? This was actually the first question which we wanted to ask with this model. And we actually, uh, so, so, so this is uh, how one would do this. All ABC methods do inference by basically finding the simulations that generate the same, uh, the summary statistics, which are closest to the real ones. Not the same, because they will never be the same normally, uh, but they will be in the neighborhood of the real data. There are many different specific technical ways to actually do this type of inference. So uh, they are reviewed in Mark Bowman's paper, for example, which was referenced. We use a particular technical way called random forests. This is not super important. Our results should be stable, basically, to whichever method you use. Uh, in each simulation, I told you that we used one of the six different backbone trees, two of them for early split, two of them for late split, and two of them for another version of late split, the very late split. Now, inferring the early history of the Bantu simply means, in this setup, choosing the correct backbone tree in our model. So what we need to do is we just needed to find the simulations with the closest summary statistics to look up which backbone tree they used. And based on that, output our inference. And this also failed. How do we know? It failed not because we failed to get an answer. We could get an answer, but I, I'm not actually even showing it to you this answer because we first did a check called the power test, which showed that we should not trust the answer that we get. So what is a power test? Uh, the test of statistical power is a test for us to correctly uncover the true reality with our statistical method. How can we do this? Because we don't know the true reality, right? This is what we're trying to find out. But for our simulations, we actually know which backbone tree which used in each simulation. So what we can do is we can set aside some simulations and we can ask, okay, I know that all of these thousand simulations come from the model with a backbone tree of this and this shape. Now, let me try to use ABC to infer for this thousand which of the six backbone trees they were generated by. And now I know the truth because I generated uh, the data myself. Well, actually, Patricia generated them. Uh, so I can then count how many times I get it right and how many times I get it wrong. And the numbers are presented here in this. Uh, uh, so look at the top row here. 
in the simplest condition. And you can see, so they are the ratios of correct answers. And those ratios are not great. What you want to see here is something close to one, maybe 90 something. What we are seeing is something like 23%, 38, 39%. This is not great. This is a little bit better than guessing at random, which would just end up in being uh, in giving us 80% correctness. If we just didn't know anything about the data, just picked at random one of the six models. But this is not much better. And things got even worse because one important part of our study was we wanted to know how reliable our results will be in case there are relatively small mistakes in the data set which we took from Rebecca Golomond. Because first of all, nobody's perfect. People can make mistakes, experts can make mistakes. And second, we know that the data set was based on similarity judgments, that it was a relatively impressionistically derived data set. Uh, so we tried to see what happens to this correctness uh, share when we add some number of artificial errors into our data on which we then ran the inference. And we saw that those numbers dropped even further. So for example, for this case, from 39% to 22. But actually, this wasn't really great to start with. So this only underscores the fact that uh, we just cannot tell uh, which of the backbone trees actually produce the real data. And we cannot tell because the summary statistics from models with different backbone trees can be quite similar to each other. So we cannot distinguish their predictions. Now, what about other parameters of the model? And here is where I have some exciting news. At least we were very excited. Our model has a lot of parameters and we can run inference for them as well. We do this uh, again using random forest, so-called random forest regression. Basically, all of the methods of ABC uh, inference would involve uh, some type of using the simulations which generate statistics close to the real data in order to infer the, uh, the parameter values. Uh, and uh, again, just as with uh, the selection of the backbone tree, we can do a check by seeing how well we're able to infer the parameters of our simulations themselves. So can we recover the truth where we know it? And the answer is for some parameters, yes, for some parameters, no. So one parameter where it wasn't possible is the N0. So N0 is uh, the parameter of the model, which is the number of distinct Bantu dialects. So a slightly fictional number, which we have at the start of our evolutionary process in this model. And I'm showing you the results here in this uh, set of diagrams on the left. So the important diagram for us is the uh, bottom one. And I will have several series uh, uh, now on the next slides too. Uh, so the global inferences is what we want to look at. The other six, they are conditional on one of the six backbone trees. And the only reason uh, they are important is to check that the results are stable across uh, all of those six uh, backbone tree scenarios. They are in all of the cases which we looked at, so it's safe to just look at this case. So what I'm showing here with the black line, the black line is the inference which the model gets for, uh, which, which our statistical inference framework gets for this N0 variable for a specific simulation results. What are those red dots? The red dot on the same vertical here is the true value of this parameter. So what we can see is that there is really no real relation to note between the black line and the red dots. Red just anywhere from the black line. Now, we have a different variable here, CE, which is the share of dialects in the Eastern zone out of all. Now, remember that this does not have any uh, relation to the empirical data yet. We have not fed the model the empirical data. We're just checking our simulations themselves. And what we can see is that this black line actually follows quite closely where the red dots are. So it cannot uh, infer this with a certainty, but it's not uh, a bad inference. So for this CE, we can make useful inferences. 
And here is the result which we like the most so far. Our model for borrowing between those uh, had two tiers. On the first tier, we had a global rate of borrowing base M, and it we allowed to vary widely between the different simulations uh, so that we can infer which ones are closest to the real ones. But then we also added for each of the six pairs of zones, we added multiplier to this rate so that uh, the rates of borrowing between the different zones are on the same order of magnitude but they can still differ from each other. So here, I'm showing you the inferences for the uh, base rate on the log scale. And the way to read this diagram is, so the gray line here is our prior, so the uh, overall range which we studied in the simulations, and the black line is the inferred probability density, so that's our posterior inferences. And we can see that this line is very different from the prior. This means that we have a strong inference that the rates are quite high here. Now, if we turn to the multipliers, um, we can see that for the different pairs of zones, for one pair, we have the inferences shifted towards the lower domain, so the multiplier is less than one. For another pair of zones, the borrowing seems to be more intense than on average, so it shifted uh, to higher than one. And then for one of the pairs, it's really following the prior more or less. Now, we also got useful inferences for the rate of lexical innovation of lexical replacement theta. And this is important because we got inferences that theta was quite high. And this, is, uh, this can be compared with the power test experiments, which I didn't show to you. But we did them and we checked how theta relates to the, uh, our ability to reconstruct the backbone tree. And we saw that with theta of five and higher, which is exactly what we're inferring, the lexical change erases the traces of the early history. There was too much lexical replacement to identify it correctly. So these are the results. And let me make a pause for two minutes and then return to do a conclusion. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'm waiting for your questions. So.
Hello again, everyone. So let me conclude and then we'll turn to the questions. Uh, so what did we learn about the bond? Well, first of all, we did obtain very good agreement between our simulation results and the real linguistic data. This validates the model. It's a very simple model, but it seems to be a useful one. The early history of the Bantu family, however, was not recoverable. The high intensity of borrowing, in contrast, was not fertile with confidence, and so was the high rate, a lexical rate of innovation. Moreover, when those two are combined together, it implies that there was too much innovation in lexical borrowing, that it erased the trace of the earlier splits of the family. Those splits were there somehow, but there is no information in this data to recover them. It's not just that we were unable to resolve a reverse slate split. Based on our results, it appears to be objectively impossible to do so using this lexical data. There is also another way to look at our results. Uh, when viewed in the context of traditional historical linguistic pantology, we obtained a new strong confirmation that the Bantu history was very much non-tree-like. At the same time, we also provided a new means to study this non-tree history, to make inferences such as, for example, the inferences about relative borrowing weights between different zones. And finally, recall phylogenetic studies about the Bantu, which tried to reconstruct a tree from lexical data, the tree, as it were. Our results on lexical replacement rate and borrowing suggest that those trees do not represent the true history. They must be capturing a lot of something else, most likely the effects of language contact. We cannot use those trees as evidence for the earliest history of the Bantu. Bantu-wide analysis should not be used as history models. They are capturing something some reality, but it's not the historical reality of the consecutive splits. More targeted, narrower phylogenetic analysis, for example, focusing on a small part of the family, on a shallower subfamily than the Bantu as a whole, may well be valid as his models, because then the time depth would be less and maybe not all of the signal is erased. Still, it would be interesting to see uh, whether the results of such lower level analysis of the lower level clades within the Bantu can be confirmed and validated by running non tree like inference of some sort. On that, let me conclude and thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to your questions. Before I start with them, let me say a thank you. And let me also show you the bibliography so that you can have it on your screens. Thank you, Igor, for this interesting presentation. And but I'm biased because I make part of the project. So can I start doing the questions? Of course. Yeah, okay. So the first question, can we use non-lexical data to make the prediction? Grammar should be more stable, shouldn't it? Uh, it depends on what we actually want to do. So uh, if we do a computational statistical study, then actually using lexical data is probably better than using grammatical data, if only for the reason that different grammatical processes are likely to happen on way more different timescales than the lexical processes. And this is a problem because what we want is we want the data which are compar as comparable as possible in the real world. So that we have a lot of roughly comparable features. For grammatical features, most of the grammatical features are in some ways unique. So uh, there might be some artifacts in our analysis if we use a lot of them. Still, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, but we probably should try to look for a large number of those so that we can try to apply the standard statistical methods of testing our results for sensitivity to our data. 
isn't a main problem to all these that the data is based only on a 100 item lexical list? Uh, and the question follows, like, I remember that Stark 2018 improved Walker and Ribeiros 2011 work that only included 100 concepts up to more than 700 and posterior's rise significantly. This work was an Arawak, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing in the wrong way, arguably, arguably a smaller fam family, but the tendency is clear. In general, I would tend to agree. Of course, the more data we have, the better. Um, the problem here is not just low posteriors, actually. The problem which we identified uh, seems to be more fundamental. It seems to be that even for those 100 concepts, which seem to be the most stable ones, or at least among the most stable ones, let's say it this way, uh, we see that there is a little uh, way to distinguish between the effects of later borrowing and earlier inheritance. And as I gave you in the example from Tilo Schadeberg's work, there are cases when certain Bantu languages do an amazing job of masking their borrowing uh, by applying regular correspondences as they are presented in their inherited lexicon. So generally it's, it's a very, very difficult problem and what our analysis using this non tree like uh, framework for inference shows is that there is a more fundamental problem here. So it seems like the rate of lexical replacement and the rate of borrowing between even the macro zones, so not between the neighboring languages, just but just big movements of words, uh, seems to be just too high in order to be able to restore the original structure of the Bantu family. This, I don't expect to change if we have uh, a longer word list. Yeah, and what is the role of extinct languages when it comes to reconstructing human history through linguistic data? I guess this is a very general methodological question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the question is, I guess, so there are different ways to construe it. So let me try it in a couple of ways and we'll see uh, whether this answers your question or not. So one way is to think about the uh, documented extinct languages. So the extinct languages from which we do have texts in one way or the other. Well, they show us a snapshot uh, earlier in time for an earlier state of some language. Maybe they don't have any living descendants. Maybe they have, uh, some uh, descendants of their cousins. Maybe they have direct descendants. In all of those cases, we might uh, glimpse some important information about what happened in the past of the language by looking at those documents. This is not strictly speaking necessary for doing historical linguistic reconstruction, but it's precisely in those families where uh, we do have data for an earlier ancestral language recorded that we can test the validity of our historical linguistic methods. And there are signif uh, significant differences between working with Mr. Bay's beast uh, or beastling for linguistic phylogeny? Uh, as long as you understand what you're doing, no. And there are technical differences between those tools. So some of them are uh, better at something, some of them are better in, in something else. Like basically the strong uh, point of Mr. Bayes is that it has some very good uh, built in uh, uh, diagnostics for your uh, MCMC analysis for your statistical analysis convergence, which are produced automatically. So if you know how to interpret them, this is very nice and very convenient. You don't have to do this yourself. If you work with Beast or BeastLink, you have to actually run several analyses yourself, several identical analyses, and then compute this, uh, this type of diagnostic to be sure. Uh, on the other hand, Beast is a much more actively developed software. Uh, and therefore, it's, uh, uh, it, it just has more models implemented. So this can be quite convenient in some cases. But generally, if you have strong signal in your data and you know how to set up the right model conceptually, uh, you should be able to get uh, good results in your regular phylogenetic analysis uh, with either. 
In fact, uh, sometimes uh, what people do in computational biology, they sometimes repeat the same analysis, the same logically defined, the same analysis with different software, just to make sure that uh, different software gives the same answer. I can tell you that I did that for some phylogenetic analysis with Mr. Bayes and Beast myself, and indeed obtained exactly the same posteriors. So, so following up on the borrowing problem, how would you proceed methodologically to decide whether a phylogenetic analysis is appropriate or not? Would strong noise in a neighbor net analysis already be the indicative of this? This is a very complex question. I don't have a simple answer to this. I think my personal answer is simply that uh, I would like to understand the language family better. So I would like to learn more about the traditional historical linguistics of this family. I would like to understand what this, for example, uh, this reticulation signal in neighbor net uh, actually corresponds to on the ground. And I would like to uh, get a feeling of how much is too much, right? So the thing is that in principle, in the tree model, uh, it's not necessary for you to have no borrowings to get a good tree if the signal of the tree is strong. So if the true history of the family was mostly tree-like, but with some overlay of those borrowings, then those borrowings can be just discounted by the uh, statistical model as basically noise. In fact, it's not noise. It's not completely random. And when the amount of these uh, non-random borrowings becomes too strong, it can obscure your signal. But this really depends on the relative strengths of noise to signal, and this will differ on a case-by-case -case basis. So I would say it's good to be aware of the problem. It's good to try to view your data from different uh, angles. And then in each specific study, you will need to make a specific judgment call as to whether this seems to be a problem or not. Okay, thank you. I guess there is no more questions. The audience say thank you to you for answering all the questions. So if there are no more questions, I would like to thank to the audience and thank you either on behalf of Faberlin for your really interesting talk. And before the end of this session, I would like to invite you to continue watching the Berlin series. And Igor, if you'd like to conclude the transmission with some final remarks, uh, the screen is yours. And Thank you very much. Sorry, there is still one more question. Can I ask it? Sorry. Of course, we still have time. Yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm still in process of learning Bayesian statistics, but I wonder, how do you select priors in case you want to infer a tree for a lesser studied language family? Well, this is a very uh, complex question because you don't select a single prior, you select a whole bunch of different priors reflecting different uh, parts of your analysis. Um, so if you're interested, you're welcome. And this, this concerns other listeners too. You're welcome to shoot me an email with your specific question. I will try to help you uh, if I can. Um, also, it's, it might be a good idea to ask some other person who uh, is involved in uh, linguistic phylogenetics, so they might be able to answer your question as well. So it's not just me. Um, but returning to your question, so how do you select a prior? Well, uh, there are kind of two uh, answers here, actually. So the first answer, in a good case, when your data have a very strong signal, it actually should be not very important which prior you select. This might seem a little bit strange, but actually, if the signal in the data is strong enough, it should overwhelm your prior. In fact, the statisticians when they're trying to do inference, they're very happy when they see that the prior has practically no effect. This means that your inference actually comes from the data. Now, actually, in linguistic practical phylogenetics, this is very, uh, very infrequently the case. Different priors might routinely lead to different results. What this means is that the assumptions behind the prior derive your inferences, drive your inferences to a large extent. This is actually a problem. Uh, unless you can make a very strong linguistic argument 
not necessarily a statistical argument, that shows that this type of prior is actually much better than that type of prior. Now, at least in my personal state of uh, knowledge, I don't know that for linguistic evolution, we know which kinds of priors are the best ones, which ones actually correspond to what happens in the real world, probabilistically. So it's hard to give you a specific answer, unfortunately. So you can try to play with different priors. You, you should try to understand what, how, how they work, what mathematical processes they actually represent, and then choose some of them, but don't stop on just a single choice. Try to change your choice to another one which is not less reasonable and see whether your results are stable to that. If they are, this is a good sign. If they are not, you need to understand why they changed. I hope this helps. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience and to you. And if, for the final remarks, if you want to say something, I, I will give you the screen. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, moderating this, Patricia, but also thank you for being a part of this project. And thank you to Sylvia and Andrea who are listening. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's our joint project. It wouldn't be possible with just a linguist like me working. Uh, the models and the actual research and all of the interpretation, all of the thinking, it was only possible thanks to our joint work. And I think it's very interesting. So the reason I'm highlighting this is not just because I, uh, I want to say thank you this way, but also because I think it represents a kind of newish model for interdisciplinary linguistic research. We can, as linguists, fruitfully collaborate with people from other sciences. It's not easy. It takes time to learn from each other. It takes time to understand each other's language, so to speak. But sometimes it's very rewarding like in this project, for example. Uh, and I would like to finish by thanking one more time the organizers, the Brazilian Linguistics Association, which developed and grew this lecture series. Uh, for me, myself, it's a fantastic resource to be able to listen to linguists from around the world speaking about their recent research, their views, and to, to see this from my home during our time of a pandemic. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. And if this is your first Avrilin lecture uh, uh, that you watched, I would really encourage you to check out the full program, to take a look at it. You will probably find a lot of talks which will be very interesting. And thank you for coming today. Thank you for staying until the end. Be well and goodbye. Bye, thank you.